Welcome everyone to this brand new genetic engineering and biotechnology news webinar entitled Streamlined Formulation of Enzyme Products. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, technical editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar presentation. Scientists have developed some clever techniques over the years to engineer molecular stability into protein molecules with the intent of maximizing shelf life. However, for many proteins and enzymes, these molecular modifications are often impractical or even impossible. So researchers often turn to formulation techniques that are designed to increase stability. Still, stability is only as good as the method and equipment employed to test storage conditions. Let's meet our speakers for this webinar who will discuss some best practices for evaluating and increasing the stability of formulated products as well as present data from long-term studies that show how actual storage stability compares to predictive data from the Uncle Screening platform. Kevin Lance is a product manager at Unchained Labs and will provide us with a brief introduction into some key features and methods that make the Uncle a go-to all-in-one stability screening platform. John Tomashik is a principal scientist at Integrated Microchromatography Systems. John has published numerous articles in the areas of membrane bioenergetics, multidrug resistance transporters, enzyme structure function relationships, and science education, as well as being the co-inventor on more than a dozen patents. John oversees protein and enzyme development at IMCS and will speak to us today about enzyme stability, its importance in the biomanufacturing process, and how the Uncle platform aids in stability testing methods. Before we begin the webinar with Kevin's presentation, I want to encourage the audience to submit questions for our Q&A session after the last talk. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can, so simply type your question into the Ask a Question box below the presentation screen and hit Submit. All right, with all that said, let's begin our webinar and hear what Kevin has to say. Kevin? Thanks for the introduction and welcome to the webinar. I'm Kevin and I'll be first giving an introduction to UNCLE as a multimodal protein characterization platform. We all know that protein formulation is hard. It requires balancing multiple factors and their interactions to develop the optimum solution with the minimum amount of time and resources. That's why we made UNCLE. UNCLE is a flexible multimodal biologic stability platform that combines three detection methods, full spectrum fluorescence, static light scattering or SLS at two wavelengths, and dynamic light scattering, or DLS. Those three detection methods can be used in 12 applications to help you understand the stability and aggregation behavior of your proteins. To test any of these applications, only nine microliters of sample is needed, and up to 48 samples can be run at once. Here's a look at how our three detection methods enable our 12 applications. By using all three detection methods in unique ways, UNCLE can give insight into protein stability not available by using one or even two of these methods alone. While we won't be going through all these applications today, here are the main tools that John will be talking about in the second half of the presentation, so I'll take a few slides to introduce each. Together, they give information on protein stability and aggregation in response to thermal stress, protein size and polydispersity as shown by DLS, and the risk of aggregation and protein formulation combinations determined by B22 and KD measurements. G22 is also available when working with very high concentrations. First, allow me to introduce the UNI. It is our sample holder that enables UNCLE to gather all its information from nine microliters. Depending on the protein, you can work with concentrations as low as 50 micrograms per mil and as high as 150 milligrams per mil. UNCLE also works across a wide range of biologics, therapeutic antibodies, enzymes, protein targets, virus-like particles, and many other proteins. The uni is composed of an array of 16 quartz cubettes that are easily loaded with a pipette. The high-grade quartz gets us great optical sensitivity for fluorescence and light scattering data, and the frame is made of a dark anodized metal that provides efficient heat transfer. The unis then go into this little blue holder that seals the sample on both ends. Because they are sealed when they go into the instrument, you don't need to worry about cross-contamination or evaporation, even for longer runs. UNCLE can hold up to three unis at a time, meaning you can run from one up to 48 samples in each experiment. One of the most powerful tools of UNCLE is its ability to monitor a protein's intrinsic fluorescence 
simultaneously with gathering SLS data to get protein thermal stability and aggregation information in just a single experiment. Here we're looking at the results of a thermal ramp experiment where protein fluorescence is being tracked in blue and SLS is in green. Fluorescence shows your proteins unfolding and quantifies that with melting temperatures at TM1 and TM2. The SLS data in green shows the aggregation behavior of your protein and reports the temperature when aggregation begins. The software's algorithms follow our zero-click analysis approach and assigns these TMs and TAGs automatically. Together, the two protein tools of intrinsic fluorescence and SLS give you an understanding of how unfolding and aggregation is occurring in response to thermal stress. Here's a look at the underlying data UNCLE gives you on a protein's intrinsic fluorescence that leads to the complete story of protein unfolding. UNCLE excites a protein at 266 nanometers for intrinsic fluorescence or 473 nanometers for when you need cyper orange dye, and then reads the resulting full emission spectrum. By controlling temperature over a thermal ramp from 15 to 95 degrees Celsius, you can detect your protein's melting behavior. This is shown in the graph with each line corresponding to a fluorescence signal at a different temperature. You can observe the redshift in the spectra as the tryptophans of this protein transition from being buried in hydrophobic pockets to a state where they are exposed to their aqueous environment. Uncle gives you flexibility in analysis too. So not only do you get full spectrum information, but four analysis methods give you flexibility since every protein is different. Proteins can redshift, blue shift, or not shift at all. The analysis method we recommend reports the barycentric mean, or BCM, shown on the top left. This is the wavelength that evenly divides the area under the curve. We found that this analysis method is the least susceptible to noise since it analyzes a large range of the fluorescence spectrum. Here we're looking closer at the use of static light scattering, or SLS, to detect aggregation during a thermal ramp. Increasing scattering of the 266 nanometer laser gives us information on when smaller aggregates begin to form. We call this the TAG-266. Likewise, since longer wavelengths scatter when hitting larger particles, SLS using the 473 nanometer laser gives us information on when larger aggregates begin to form at the TAG-473. Having information from both lasers at the same time gives you better sensitivity and a better detection range than with either laser alone. Dynamic light scattering, or DLS, is UNCLE's third detection method, and it is a highly sensitive technique to give you data on your protein size and size distribution. Here we're looking at some example data of a monomeric sample in blue, a sample with some aggregation in green, and a sample with some significant aggregation in yellow. I want to point out that the x-axis has shown a log scale. The metrics that are reported from DLS data are the z-average diameter, which is a weighted average of diameter, and a polydispersity index value, a PDI, which is a measure of the width of the size distribution. Looking left to right across the slide at these samples, we see an increasing trend in the z-average diameter, which agrees with what we know about the sample state. Likewise, the size distribution for these samples widen as you look from left to right. Since higher PDI values indicate wider size distributions, PDI would also show an increasing trend here. In this data set, UNCLE has collected DLS data on two monoclonal antibodies at 15 degrees C before a thermal ramp and at 95 degrees C after that ramp. You can see that both antibodies have experienced a change in sizing, but that MAB2 experienced a much larger degree of aggregation than MAB1. The Z average and PDI values for MAB2 at 95C would both show significant increases over the values at 15C and would quantify the shift towards larger particles and a wider size distribution. DLS is also a powerful technique on its own without a thermal ramp. It can be used to quality check proteins before you start an experiment. Here, UNCLE has tested five samples with DLS. Four show an expected average size, while the fifth has undergone too many freeze-thaw cycles has aggregated and can be discarded. Since DLS can be performed in about 30 seconds on each sample, such a protein quality check is a rather quick assay. A similar analysis could be done to quickly glimpse at the impact of new formulations or reagents on your protein. When working to optimize formulations like John is, TM, TAG, and DLS tell you a lot about your proteins, but UNCLE offers another set of tools to look at how your proteins are behaving in your formulations. Having both DLS and SLS in one system allows UNCLE to produce both B22 and KD data to take a peek at how your proteins interact with each other. 
When looking at DLS or SLS data over a small range of protein concentrations, you can see if B22 and KD are positive and therefore indicate repulsive protein-protein interactions, or if they're negative and indicate attractive protein-protein interactions. It's important to watch out for attractive protein-protein interactions since they could mean your protein is at risk for aggregation. Here we're showing the B22 results from a B22 and KD experiment on two formulations of lysozyme, low salt and high salt. In this model system, you can see that lysozyme in low salt, in green, has a positive slope, which indicates a positive B22 and weak repulsive protein-protein interactions. Meanwhile, in high salt, which is the known condition where lysozyme precipitates, the B22 value has changed dramatically and is now negative, indicating attractive protein-protein interactions. Besides the 12 standard applications I mentioned earlier, UNCLE also gives you the freedom to design your own experiments. For example, if you wanted to understand the impact of some manufacturing process, you can model the temperature behavior of the system over time and use UNCLE's three detection methods to characterize your protein's behavior. And for regulatory compliance, UNCLE software can be enabled with the 21 CFR Part 11 compliance package. So if you're working in a regulated environment, we offer easy ways to lock down your data, get your audit trails and reports, and sign off on all your experiments. So that's the case for why UNCLE is my favorite protein characterization tool. It's a one-stop multimodal instrument for protein characterization that gives you many applications and insights into your protein's behavior. Importantly, UNCLE can do this with rock bottom sample volumes and can efficiently combine different detection measurements into single experiments. Lastly, UNCLE also lets you customize experiments to answer your own questions. Now, I'll give the floor to John to talk about his experiences with UNCLE in streamlining formulations for enzyme products. Thanks, Kevin. That was a great introduction to the UNCLE system and its capabilities and should transition nicely into John's presentation coming up in just a moment. But before we move on, I want to remind the audience once again to submit questions for our Q&A session that will begin right after John's talk. Just type your question into the ask a question box below the presentation screen and hit submit. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. All right, let's move on to John's presentation. John, the audience is yours. Hi, my name is John Tomaszek. I'd like to thank Kevin and Unchained Labs for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, I am a principal scientist uh, with Integrated Microchromatography Systems. We're a company that manufactures uh, industrial enzymes for clinical and forensic drug testing. And we also make, as our name indicates, microchromatographic tips for high throughput protein purification and characterization. Today I'm going to talk to you about how we streamline and accelerate formulation of our enzyme products. In today's talk I'm going to cover several things. First I want to begin simply by defining what we mean by stability and why it should be important to us. Then I'm going to go through a variety of factors that affect stability both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how we evaluate stability, both in terms of the uh, theory and the principles and the methods. Uh, I then will go into the actual ways that we formulate to increase the stability of an enzyme product. And then finally, I will go through some data that shows uh, actual long-term stability testing and how that compares to the predictive parameters that instruments like uh, Unchained's UNCLE instrument uh, provides. By all accounts, Marie Curie was a very modest and generous woman. Uh, she was not known for her sense of humor, but she was of course known as a brilliant physical chemist and physicist. And when she made this statement, she clearly was not thinking about biological systems. As biologists and biochemists, of course, what realize is that inactive matter in biological terms means dead. And so this is not what we want to achieve. This is not what we mean by stability. What we mean by stability is one of three things typically. I am gonna focus primarily on activity, uh, enzyme activity, because that's what is important uh, for our 
products and for our customers. However, um, other considerations that are important to different industries include the integrity of the protein, which means its structural integrity, its tendency either to degrade or to aggregate. And then third, and this is important I think to most uh, industries involving uh, biotech, uh, biologics, or enzymes, or proteins, is the appearance of the product. Customers want things that have high clarity and and good color, and as the illustration indicates, uh, things that turn brown or get cloudy are not usually preferred. These things are important to us, as I just pointed out. Customers are demanding, and also because it takes us a lot of time and effort to generate a, a quality biological product, and so we want to make sure that we can preserve it for as long as possible. There are many ways that people will preserve proteins, and I'm just going to quickly go through a few ones that you're probably already familiar with. Freezing enzymes, it's fast and easy, but ice crystals or just cold inactivation can be a problem for some enzymes. Lyophilization is a method that some people prefer, but it does require a certain amount of time, uh, equipment, and expertise. It is not a straightforward process, and it can be very difficult to optimize at times. Precipitation, certain enzyme products can be sold as an ammonium sulfate pellet or other form of uh, precipitate, but the reconstitution conditions can uh, result in different outcomes depending on what a customer does. The, what I call the academic approach, you add more glycerol and then freeze it so that it doesn't actually form ice crystals, but uh, keeps the enzyme at the coldest temperature possible. This I think is fine for again, in, for your own personal use or in, in one's own environment, but for a product that needs to be shipped and sold, uh, this is less successful. So that leaves us with custom formulation, coming up with uh, a chemical environment that is good for the protein over a long term. There are two broad categories uh, of phenomenon that I think about when thinking about enzyme stability. The first broad category are intrinsic factors. These are the qualities of the protein itself that determine its structure and by extension its stability. There are ways that we can approach the question of stability by uh, genetic engineering or other protein engineering methods, chemical modification methods. These are not part of today's discussion. What I find is that the engineering is best left to the function of the protein in its application environment and that for purposes of storage stability, we want to focus on the environmental aspects of the enzyme. And so these are the extrinsic factors of which I break them into two categories. Environmental, which I would say are within limited control. It's going to be the temperature. It's going to be the degree to which the enzyme is jostled. And it's going to be the <clears throat> potentially external chemical elements, oxygen being probably key among them that could affect the enzyme activity. Uh, and then formulation, which is the things we put in there to modulate and negate negative impacts of the environmental or possibly the intrinsic factors. So let's begin by going through the intrinsic aspects of protein stability. To do this, I'm going to use a cartoon. This is SAM. SAM is a stable protein. SAM has a number of features, basic structural features that we should keep in mind as we think about uh, what contributes to SAM stability. N and C termini. The N terminus, of course, is connected to an N terminal domain, and that is hinged to a C terminal domain. These fold essentially separately and independently during the synthesis of the protein. Other factors then are going to be bound up in the structure, and these will contribute to its stability. Uh, I have just hypothetically considered a couple of metal cofactors. There are, are potentially disulfide bonds that will occur within or between protein domains. And then <clears throat> I've added a porphyrin ring just because uh, it, it completes the picture. So the surface of SAM is going to be mostly hydrophilic and charged amino acids because they interact with the aqueous milieu and that is uh, most energetically favorable. Similarly, the 
what we have come to learn as the hydrophobic core of the protein uh, is going to be mostly hydrophobic amino acids and this will include uh, a bulk of the tryptophan molecules or tryptophan residues which are responsible for the fluorescence signal that is used to measure its melting temperature uh, sam's melting temperature uh, in in the uh, uncle the interface between the domains uh, could have a mixed composition depending on the protein it will tend probably to be more hydrophobic than hydrophilic but there will be salt bridges and disulfide linkages and other uh, potential interactions of those nature to to keep it together and then finally although this is not shown in the picture sam can potentially interact with other proteins uh, more more proteins like sam or possibly heterologous uh, proteins and these interactions are going to be similar to those that we see between the domains. SAM, if exposed to harsh conditions, will start to come apart. The first condition I consider are changes in the redox state. This can change the valency of the metal cofactors. It can cause disulfide bonds to break or to uh, rearrange and other redox elements such as porphyrin rings uh, can also undergo changes that affect the proteins act or the enzymes activity add to this now some increase in temperature and or some kinetic energy and <clears throat> what will first happen is domains will start to separate uh, the molten or the no sorry not the molten core but the hydrophobic cores will uh, maintain the integrity of the individual domains, but the interactions between domains will start to loosen. Once that happens, now you can have um, anomalous interactions, uh, intermolecular reactions as well as intramolecular reactions. This will be a function of the protein concentration. Uh, and this can start chain reactions where uh, they start to aggregate. And then finally, with enough heat and or kinetic energy, the actual hydrophobic core will start to rearrange and interact with uh, other protein uh, hydrophobic regions in an intramolecular way and this is now what i would call total and catastrophic uh, uh, aggregation of the protein you don't usually come back from this condition and so by marie curie's definition we have achieved perfect stability here that covers the intrinsic and actually the environmental extrinsic factors that I wanted to talk about. And now we're going to get into the factors that in solution that we can modulate to uh, alter and control uh, enzyme stability. There are uh, a wide range of buffers that we can use and additives or excipients depending on the industry you come from that we can include here are some factors that i like to consider up front first and I, I i i will stress this now and probably again but ph more than just about anything else will dramatically affect the stability of the protein and its tendency to aggregate you want to find the optimum ph uh, first before going on and trying to adjust everything else you do want to be thinking at all times about the particular, your particular case. Every enzyme and protein is different. And what's a rule for one protein or group of proteins may not be true for yours. And so specific knowledge really is your first best guide. You want to be thinking about the cost of materials. Uh, we want our formulations to be as parsimonious as possible, which is to say the fewest ingredients and the cheapest ingredients. And finally, uh, you want to be thinking about how the formulation is going to affect your customer's application or downstream processes. It has to be compatible. And, uh, and the worst thing to do is to formulate a, uh, a perfectly stable enzyme and then discover that your customer can't use it. So when thinking about buffers and salts, uh, the place we want to start is going to be the Hoffmeister series. This uh, ordering of ions was uh, accomplished by Franz Hofmeister, a fellow Czech scientist who has been memorialized for his work with this bronze plaque at Charles University in Prague. And what this basically says is the degree to which these different ions, and 
the emphasis really is on the anions because they have a much stronger influence, tend to order or disorder water. And so the chaotropes lead to disordering phenomenon. They will knock things apart. They tend to destabilize proteins, but they also sometimes will help prevent uh, aggregation interactions from occurring. So we don't exclude them, but we tend to steer away from the chaotropes. We will steer more towards cosmotropic, which are ordering uh, ions. But again, you'll notice ammonium and sulfate are at this end, at the cosmotropic end of the spectrum. And of course, that's used to precipitate protein, which is an aggregation effect that we probably want to avoid, even though, and this is why ammonium sulfate is used, it results in a stable and active uh, precipitate of protein. Most of the ions and buffers that we're gonna think about are gonna fall somewhere in the middle of this range. And so you can see you know, things from citrate to acetate, all of those are potentially buffering components that we might consider. Um, other exceptions that you might want to keep in mind are going to be divalent cations like magnesium and calcium, which if they are a cofactor in the protein might prove to be a stabilizing additive. So pH. Uh, this is actually one of my first experiments on the uncle and I made a, a simple beginner's mistake. I didn't push the melting temperature, the the temperature scan up far enough. So the software was unable to pick melting temperatures uh, out from the data. However, because I had all of the raw data and I show that over on the right, uh, you're looking at a, at a temperature, temperature range from 15 to I think about 60 or 70 degrees. And you're looking at the fluorescent spectra from about 250 to 550 nanometers. Um, I just went into the raw data. I found a wavelength that showed a temperature dependent change and I plotted that as a function of pH. And <clears throat> if I flip it and uh, put it into two dimensions, you can see the yellow line forms a cline of uh, essentially stability, increasing stability as the pH goes up. Now this again is not the approach that I would necessarily recommend taking done properly, the experiments will give you very nice melting temperatures and you can use those uh, to make decisions about a preferred pH. But the beauty is that there is all, all of these raw data that you can go in and work with if you have uh, reasons for doing so. Here is uh, a look at the uh, dynamic light scattering data that we get from the instrument again across the same pH range. And what we see is essentially decreasing uh, molecular size information. The, I'm not gonna speak too much about the absolute numbers coming from uh, the dynamic light scattering because uh, they're oftentimes dependent on the particular situation that one is working in. But what I will say is a general principle uh, when formulating enzymes, you are looking to see decreases in these numbers. And the one that we most tend to look at is the PDI, the polydispersity index of, of the system. So in choosing the pH, what I used primarily was the melting temperature. I used that as my principal guide and to a lesser extent, the dynamic light scattering data. Now, in order to choose a particular buffer system and a particular buffer concentration, I am going to focus more on other parameters. So here what we see is the effect of changing the buffer concentration and the buffer composition on the melting temperature. And to make a long story short, there's very little change. The, we have two buffer systems, A and B, and in the case of buffer, uh, buffer system A, I have it plus and minus a, a divalent cofactor that is part of the enzymatic, the catalytic cycle. Um, and you can see that inclusion of the cofactor might have a slight effect on the melting temperature at the higher buffer concentration. In contrast to the melting temperature for the aggregation temperature uh, measured by SLS at 266, what we see is that the lower concentrations are generally favored over the higher concentrations. We have higher uh, aggregation temperatures at lower buffer concentration. What we also see is that buffer B in the absence of cofactor performs best at higher concentration, both buffer B and buffer A at the, uh, without the cofactor, uh, both buffers perform worse at the higher concentration. 
the metal cofactor is able to maintain the performance of buffer A uh, at any concentration, but it certainly does not change much and it doesn't improve. So in this case, we would favor uh, buffer B without the cofactor uh, at low concentration. Here, here we see the, the uh, same data except for the longer wavelength static light scattering and what you can see is the story is the same. The lower concentration of buffer B is preferred over either uh, composition of A plus or minus the metal cofactor. Again, the metal cofactor does seem to uh, increase the temperature of aggregation somewhat at the higher concentration. So looking at this again, here we have again two different buffer systems, A and B. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same A and B as last time, uh, but the the trends you will see are, are similar. What we see is that for uh, buffer A, there might be a slight uh, increase in melting temperature towards the lower concentrations, but for buffer system B, we definitely see a trend towards higher melting temperatures uh, at higher buffer concentrations. But for both buffer systems now, what we see is that lower buffer concentrations increase the aggregation temperature at the lower wavelength and as measured at the higher wavelength. And so based on this, we would lean towards a lower buffer concentration. And uh, I can't remember now, but I think we ended up going with the B composition in this particular case. Looking at the polydispersity data, uh, what you see is that it ranges over roughly two orders of magnitude. Uh, we don't Again, we're not really concerned about the absolute number and what it means. What we know for our system and in, uh, with our enzymes that a number that's at, at or below one is usually you know, a, a perfectly acceptable number. And so that's what we look for. Uh, you will notice that really there is not a huge difference in the polydispersity uh, across the buffer concentration. And I should add that to the extent that we see um, the waviness of the lines, uh, the dynamic light scattering is much more sensitive to the sample preparation. And because we're trying to work fast, uh, the samples are less amenable to the dynamic light scattering measurements than they are to the tryptophan fluorescence and the static light scattering data. So there tends to be a little bit more error in our data for the um, dynamic light scattering measurements. Uh, just a little aside, an uh, interesting story here where we have two different buffers, one of which uh, is a substrate mimetic for the enzyme in question. It potentially can bind as uh, in the active site of the enzyme. And what you can see is that, again, looking at the melting temperatures, the substrate mimetic seems to have a higher melting uh, temperature and has a single, it's a monophasic uh, melting curve, whereas buffer one shows a distinct uh, biphasic melting profile. And in fact, we get two clean, distinct melting temperatures from it. Uh, but <clears throat> If we now look at the aggregation data, again, it switches on us. Buffer one shows much higher uh, aggregation uh, temperatures relative to buffer two. And if we look at the longer wavelength, we see the same effect. And in fact, we see very modest uh, aggregation uh, for buffer one compared to buffer two. And so again, it's just an interesting, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, factors that can, again, interact with your protein can alter the behavior of the uh, aggregation and melting temperatures of the protein. That brings us to our first set of excipients or additives. I'm going to use the term additive because I'm an industrial biotechnologist. Uh, <clears throat> salts are the first category. And again, the Hofmeister series is kind of our guide to what we're going to use uh, or try. And what you see, first, let me point out the control. The control, and this is a common phenomenon we see for just about all additive categories, the, the, even the lowest concentration of additive tends to drop the melting and aggregation temperatures relative to uh, the no additive control. And you see that here. Uh, but what you also see is that for the melting temperature, there is very little change in the case of uh, an added salt, but the aggregation temperatures are 
steadily going up. And so for a, a good salt additive, this is a fairly common pattern that we see. So the trend up is what we're really focused on, and the endpoints do end up at a higher aggregation temperature than the control. The PDI generally goes down, which is again what we would like to see, uh, and the other dynamic light scattering uh, parameters, uh, again, they, they change, but not, not significantly. Carbohydrates are a common additive uh, in formulations. This includes sugars, uh, glycols, glycerol is in this category. What you can see is an upward trend for both the melting temperature and the aggregation uh, temperatures. The uh, dynamic light scattering data is again a little bit more scattered uh, and we again prefer to see a downward trend but it's not not critical and to the extent that we see the sort of fluctuation that we see here it relates more to sample preparation and the the greater delicacy I'd say of the of the measure organics can be useful for some proteins, not all. Uh, detergents are the most common category, uh, in, are the most common uh, example of this category. And in this case, there's a slight downward trend to the melting temperature, but again, a slight upward trend for the uh, aggregation temperatures. And the dynamic light scattering data shows no real trend one way or the other. It is fairly scattered and doesn't change over a particularly large range. What I will say is that I don't have any really good examples of a super successful organic additive for the enzymes that I work with, and that's just the nature of the beast. The other thing that I'm not showing here, but I will mention, uh, is the possibility of adding uh, various redox buffers and uh, protectants. Most common among these would be things like DTT or beta mercaptoethanol, uh, possibly glutathione or some other small redox molecules. Uh, we did not test them because they were not we knew that they were not going to be important for, for the enzymes that we're working with. But what I can say is that uh, you can get some limited information uh, from the uncle using these uh, on these, these components. I do believe, however, that they represent uh, activities that are going to ultimately have to be measured over longer term experiments. The, the wonderful thing about everything that I've just shown you, these are experiments that took maybe a week or two to do. And so we can do these formulation, uh, we can go through the formulation protocol uh, fairly rapidly to get to a final reasonable formulation. Here's a quick summary of all the additives. Uh, it is essentially the endpoints of a bunch of experiments like what you uh, just saw in the graphs. And uh, there are, a in this particular case, uh, A3 through A6 are stabilizers that seem to improve aggregation temperatures for the most part. And then A1 and A2 are ones that significantly decrease uh, the polydispersity and the other dynamic light scattering parameters. So these are things that we might want to try in uh, combinatorial uh, methods. And that brings us then to the final step in the process. You take your winners, um, and they don't have to be huge winners, as I'll show, but you want to now combine them in various ways, and you want to do this with the greatest efficiency possible. There are a whole slew of different design of experiment methods out there. This is um, essentially a box banking type of experiment. And what you can see is that I'm going to point out uh, additive A uh, by itself actually seems to have a slight negative effect across all of the temperature parameters that uh, we've measured here. But if you look at our final composition, which has A, B, and C, uh, component D was included because it did under one condition seem to have a positive effect. But what you can see here is that it has a very negative correlation to a good outcome. And so D, D is for disaster, and we dropped it from the from experiment. But the other three uh, give us the most positive result. And if you compare it against just B and C, you can see that now in the presence of B and C, A actually has a positive and a statistically meaningful improvement on the melting and aggregation temperatures of the protein. So this is how we come to a final formulation that in this particular case would have three components. Okay, so the experiments that I just described, as I say, cover maybe two weeks worth of work. 
three, uh, depending on how long the the design of experiment style combinatorial work uh, takes you. Uh, at the end of that, you're now going to have a formulation, and there are two directions we want to go with it. One, we're going to want to go into long-term stability testing. This includes uh, accelerated aging methods. I recognize that accelerated aging methods are somewhat controversial. Not everybody thinks that they're a good idea. Uh, in my own experience, and that is limited to industrial biotech, uh, I have always had positive outcomes from doing accelerated aging and using it as a predictor for long-term stability. So over the course of a few months, you can get data that allow you to make predictions out to 6, 12, 18-month windows. And I have found that, again, in my experience, those estimates, properly uh, measured and made, uh, are usually conservative and you usually end up with stability that's as good or better than what you predicted. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those long-term uh, stability experiments and show you some of the data that we've collected. And then I think then this is the real key. The UNCLE allows you to measure two parameters, uh, B22 and KD, which I'm going to admit are pushing the bounds of my own understanding. But essentially, they r relate to the tendency of proteins to self-associate and aggregate. And Positive values of both B22 and KD indicate a tendency for proteins to repel each other and therefore a disinclination to aggregation, whereas negative values tend to indicate a tendency to aggregate. And so what I will do is, after I've shown you some of our long-term data, go back and show you the KDs and B22s that we got for some of these compositions and correlate them to the actual long-term stability. So for an accelerated aging experiment, uh, the first thing we have to have is some way of measuring uh, our enzyme or protein's quality of interest. I said at the beginning that for me, this would be enzyme activity. So this represents just a simple activity assay where we're looking at product released over a short period of time. The slope of that represents the enzyme activity. This is how we, again, quantify it. What we do now is we take samples of enzyme and we store them under some condition. In this case, it's condition of increasing temperature. So we have samples stored at all these different temperatures and we measure the activity uh, at intervals over an extended period of time, days, weeks, or years. From these, we can get an inactivation rate constant. It's the slope of these lines and it's just simply a first order decay. These inactivation rate constants can now be plotted on a semi-log uh, plot uh, against reciprocal temperature. And the result is what most of you will recognize, I'm sure, as an Arrhenius plot. Uh, the Arrhenius plot is one of several methods for plotting these data. Uh, it is actually considered to be an empirical as opposed to a mechanistic approach. And again, with all due respect to people who prefer more mechanistic models, which are fine, and I encourage you to use them if that's what you're familiar with, the fact remains there is so much in the literature about Arrhenius plots and various ways of fitting Arrhenius data that it just, I default to this simply because it, it gives me more options when I want to uh, analyze my data. But this can be done a lot of different ways, and I'll just say that and move on. Uh, here we see uh, what is a beautiful but probably atypical result where we have a nearly linear relationship. And in fact, if you ignore the, the point down there at the far right, which is at the coldest temperature, those that's a very nice linear and, and again, predicted uh, result uh, for an Arrhenius plot. The, the fact is most Arrhenius plots are not linear and there then has to be some form of altered Arrhenius equation or uh, other hand waving to try to explain what happened. I think even this shows a bit of a hockey puck bend there. And so I, I will try to find a best fit to the data and use that for interpolating values, but I would not generally recommend extrapolating. Uh, 
the point you're really most interested in is that one at the coldest temperature probably and the half-life that it gives us in this case it's 250 days this is an example where I have put an enzyme B into a formulation that was actually designed for another enzyme uh, enzyme A and enzyme A and enzyme B are both very similar enzymes similar activities but this formulation was for was designed for A and B. It's fairly stable, but 250 days is not really as good as we try to achieve. If I look at enzyme A in its own formulation, though, now you can see where custom formulation is both effective and critical to achieving a good outcome. This has almost twice the half-life of enzyme B in this formulation. We also now see a distinctly nonlinear Arrhenius uh, relationship and Again, I would fit this with uh, an alternative model. I haven't actually shown a fit here, but, and I would use that to calculate half-lives at different temperatures. Here, now, we have what I'll simply call formulation X. It proves to be an extremely effective formulation for, in this case, enzymes A and C. And there's a dotted line and below which I say we have perfect stability. By perfect, I simply mean that the rate of uh, any, any inactivation rate below that point is essentially within the error of the assay over the time which we've measured. So it's accelerated aging, but we can't actually measure instability over the time period that we've done it here. And so we just, again, we'll call that tentatively perfect stability. But it represents a period of almost a half-life of almost two years. So that that is, by our standards, highly successful. So how does this relate to the parameters B22 and KD? B22 has, as I understand it, has more to do with the intrinsic properties of the protein. It has less to do with the extrinsic, the environmental and formulation components. KD is a combination of both. We would expect therefore to be, there to be some sort of at least modest correlation between them. The total data show very weak correlation, but if I eliminate the two, I, won't, I don't wanna call them outliers, but if we eliminate the two unusual cases, the remaining cases in the corner here now have a much better correlation. They are still, again, not identical parameters and, and each one needs to be sort of taken on its own merits. We would expect, of course, that the KD, since what we the protein hasn't been changing, but the, the formulation has, we'd expect the KD now to reflect these changes more so than the B22. If we now look at the relationship between B22 and the half-life and KD in the half-life, we see a couple of things. First, the example where we had the very low half-life, what we see is that the B22 is low, but the KD is surprisingly high. Um, <clears throat> and, and for the purposes of the correlation calculation, that one point throws it way off. If you look at the remaining data, what we see is a very strong correlation between the KD and the half-life, which is what we would expect. We see a fairly good correlation between the B22 and the half-life as well, although it's not actually as good as the KD if we ignore the low half-life datum. There are, of course, ways that we can combine both B22 and KD into various uh, empirical formulas and equations and try to coax out higher correlations. I would say that this is uh, a, an exercise that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and I would warn people to tread cautiously with that. But more importantly, the KD has proved for us, with caveats, to be a very good predictor of a good formulation, and obviously we temper that with the B22. So if we see both of them are high, we can be pretty confident we've got a good formulation. Whereas if one or the other of them is low, then we start to think, well, maybe we can do better on the formulation. So this becomes a final test on any composition that we come up with. And as I say, if we are getting high numbers and the KDs range over a couple orders of magnitude, if we're getting in the hundreds, we feel pretty confident that we've got a good formulation.
So I think it's important at this stage to ask, why are we losing activity? Because there are multiple reasons why uh, activity loss could be occurring. And the, the short story is that we believe, and I think I can demonstrate, that it's primarily due to aggregation. But in addition to aggregation, there are other possible causes, proteolysis, proteolysis being the most obvious uh, and frequent problem that people will have with protein formulations. Um, there are also, in many instances, uh, again, it doesn't really apply to us, but uh, for some people, uh, redox and activation will be a problem. The enzymes that we work with are highly purified. Um, they are concentrated, and uh, they are prepared <laughs> Excuse me. They're prepared from hosts that have been deleted uh, of protease genes, and so uh, because of the concentration and the purity, we suspect that irreversible denaturation is probably the major factor in activity loss. And so, if you look here on the left side of the graph, as we these are uh, samples that were taken from the long-term stability test. So these are samples that are several months old. They've been preserved at different temperatures, and what you can see from the DLS is that. Uh, as the temperature goes up, the size population or the, the, the population of larger size molecules also increases. So there you can see the trend with this gray arrow. And if I just do a quick blow up, a quick blow up of the uh, cold and hot temperatures, what you can see is that there's been a, essentially a quantitative shift from the uh, smaller molecular size to the higher molecular size. These data are further supported by uh, SDS page gels, which I'm not showing, but which show a definite uh, tendency towards aggregation of the protein. We see a small amount of degradation. There are some smaller fragments in some instances, not all, but we definitely see a tendency towards uh, larger complexes. Some of them probably still active, and yet others even larger, some that won't even enter the gel that are probably in uh, inactive uh, aggregates of protein. So in conclusion, then, I want to offer you the following uh, sort of key points and ideas. First and foremost, uh, take an inventory of the unique features, cofactors, uh, and other properties of your protein or enzyme. This is your first best guide as to sort of where to start with things or perhaps things to definitely try or to exclude uh, in as you go screening different uh, additives and excipients. Uh, before getting into the the additive screen, you want to optimize the pH and the buffer composition. Use the melting temperature as your primary guide to optimizing the pH, with a, a, a secondary consideration being the DLS sizing data. And then as you uh, pick a particular buffer and a particular buffer concentration, start using <coughs> excuse me, the aggregation temperature as, uh, as your principal guide. Then uh, start screening additives and excipients. Again, aggregation temperatures are going to be your principal guide to the, uh, to the choices. And once you have a set of what you think are candidate additives, uh, use design of experiment approaches to combine them in different ways and find an optimized blend of additives. Finally, measure the B22 and the KD for your, what you think is your perfect formulation. You're looking for positive values and you really want to see that both the B22 and the KD achieve high and consistent positive values. This indicates a disinclination for aggregation. And these formulations now are your best candidates to move into whatever sort of long-term stability testing you prefer. So, uh, I want to thank you, and I also want to acknowledge and thank my uh, co-workers and colleagues. Uh, Andrew Lee is the CEO and CSO of IMCS, and Caleb, Gary, and Enda uh, are the members of my team who gathered much of the data that you saw today. Uh, plus, I have many other colleagues who have been supportive and helpful uh, in my work here. And with that, I thank you and open this up to questions. Thanks, John. That was a great explanation of how stability works and some very nice data on the factors that affect stability over time. All right, this is your last chance to submit questions for our speakers as the Q&A session is coming up.
Just type your question in the Ask a Question box below the presentation screen and hit Submit. So it looks like we have some really great questions that have come in already, and let's try to get to as many of them as we can. So give us a moment on our side while we get everything situated, and the Q&A session will begin presently. All right, everyone. Looks like we've got some really great questions, so let's start the Q&A. Our first question is for Kevin. Kevin, what does SLS mean? Uh, so SLS is static light scattering. And what this means from a, a uncle and sample perspective is we're shining lasers at your sample, uh, in this case a 266 nanometer laser and a 473 nanometer laser. And the sample, you know, kind of is a little bit cloudy, it's a little bit turbid. Uh, so it's a little bit like shining a flashlight on a cloudy or a foggy day, excuse me. Uh, so when that happens, the laser gets reflected at 90 degrees, and the sort of concentration of particles in your sample is indicative, uh, you know, is related to how much scattering you see of those lasers. So that is one way that you can, you know, detect if your sample is starting to aggregate and, and scatter more, uh, and it's a good in the way of tracking your, your aggregation as it relates to temperature. And then to add on to that, Kevin, um, you know, can you measure sub-visible particles or aggregates with Uncle? Uh, yeah, so in addition to that static light scattering uh, application that I just mentioned, you can also look at sub-visible sub particles with dynamic light scattering. Uh, this tracks how intensity changes over time, and what you get from this is an understanding of basically are your particles small or large. Uh, and this allows you to look at particles from, you know, with diameters in the fractions of nanometers all the way up to about 1,000 nanometers um, and get to a, a good understanding of is your sample monodispersed, polydispersed, is it, is it small, is it large, and kind of a quantitative understanding of diameter there as well. Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, John, a uh, question for you. One of our audience members would like to know if you could provide a little bit more detail regarding the composition of the buffer and molarity. Um, sure. The uh, the specific compositions that I described, I, there's no value in my going into them in any detail simply because they are particular to the protein. But what I can tell you is that the buffers, again, uh, are going to be chosen based in what's known to be their known compatibility with your particular protein system and their cost. Uh, so, I mean, it could be tris, it could be phosphate, it could be citrate. And in terms of the concentration, we look at a range usually from as low as five millimolar up to 500 millimolar. You can go outside of that. It's going to depend obviously on the on the buffering capacity of the particular buffer system at the particular pH that you end up targeting. So each of these things has to be custom designed based on your protein. Uh, you also want to be thinking about compatibility with other factors in the system. So for example, if you decide to go with a phosphate buffer system, you probably don't want to be adding calcium or magnesium. You will get an aggregation effect and it will have nothing to do with protein. All right, great. Thanks, John. Uh, Kevin, question for you. Um, for the uncle section of the talk, full-spectrum fluorescence was mentioned a few times. Why wouldn't you just use the ratio of intensity at 350 to 330 nanometers? Ah, okay. So for full-spectrum fluorescence on the uncle, there's kind of two key reasons why that's useful. Uh, first is to get better unfolding data. Uh, so if you're looking at your unfolding uh, fluorescence spectrum, Having the full spectrum helps you look at all the different unfolding behaviors that can happen. So there's red shift, uh, blue shift, or, or no shift. And if you're looking at just the ratio of intensities at 350 to 330, you can miss those proteins that have no shift and just decrease in fluorescence intensity. The ratio result will look something like a flat line in those cases. So when you're able to look at the full spectrum, you can then derive metrics from it that are really helpful in understanding your protein's behavior. Um, you can also look specifically at, at tyrosine versus tryptophan fluorescence and get an understanding of what's going on there. And uh, secondly, you can look at that full spectrum data to kind of look at other events along the full spectrum, like 
using Cypro Orange for unfolding events, or even Cyber Gold or similar dyes to look at genetic uh, material, maybe if you're looking at a VLP and are interested in when uh, uh, DNA is released from the particle. Um, so that's kind of a, the two major advantages for full spectrum fluorescence. All right, great, thanks, Kevin. John, a question for you. One of our audience members asks, are there any examples where stability for an enzyme was achieved by using non-aqueous solvent? Um, great question. Uh, what I can say is that in my own experience, the proteins that I and enzymes that I've worked with uh, would not be compatible with a, a purely organic uh, solvent, but those enzymes are out there. And so I see no reason why you couldn't do that. Uh, it really is, uh, if the enzyme, again, if, if the enzyme can take it, then, then it, it, I think, is a perfectly reasonable uh, uh, approach to take. Um, Kevin might have something more to say about that. Yeah, and actually from the uncle's perspective, the only materials that the sort of formulation is seeing will be silicone and quartz. So those are going to be very robust to most uh, most organics additives like that, especially at the concentrations they're being added in. Um, but typically we'll only see, you know, very small concentrations or things like glycerol. And as long as it doesn't interfere with the fluorescence signal, uh, the uncle is perfectly happy to, to read it. All right, great. Uh, John, another question for you. Um, have any bifunctional or multiple domain enzymes been stabilized? Um, yes. Uh, we work with multi-domain enzymes, and uh, in fact, I, without going into too much detail, would say that stabilization between the domains uh, is a, a very important aspect of it. So the the un, again the unfolding pathway is typically going to involve uh, uh, failure of interactions between domains before you get to the absolute loss of of core structural integrity. So this approach, I think, is actually highly amenable to multi-domain and even multimeric proteins. All right, John, we have another question for you, so stay with us. Um, and our audience member asked, in case our protein harbors an enzymatic activity, should we add an enzymatic, enzymatic activity monitor during stability study? All right. Um, I'm just based on the way the question is phrased, I'm guessing that this enzymatic activity, this enzymatic activity uh, is potentially a contaminant. It's not the actual uh, protein of interest. What I would say is that, again, for your own QC reasons, you probably want to be monitoring that activity. If it doesn't in any way affect the overall uh, application of your protein, then uh, it's obviously it's not a problem, and that's fine. I would not use it as a guide to the stability of your protein of interest uh, because it, different proteins are going to, uh, and enzymes are going to, their stabilities are going to be independent of each other to a large extent in a system like this. And so that, if it's a trace activity that is, a, as I say, a, a, just a, uh, a carryover, not, a, not the actual enzyme uh, or protein of interest, um, it, its behavior is not something that you can use to track your protein of interest. So, so I would say you can track it, but I would not use it as, as a standard for, for your, your target. You need to have an assay that is oriented towards the protein that you are actually trying to um, purify and uh, presumably market. Great. And we have one last question. Uh, John, it's also going to be for you. Um, the audience member asked, one of the additives that was mentioned in a slide is uh, the organic addi additive, uh, which includes proteins. Um, if any additional protein is added to your enzymatic product, wouldn't that interfere with the readout of the assays, for example, DLS or SLS uh, that you use? Uh, absolutely. It's, you're you're going to see it in there. Uh, I there are there are ways potentially to deconvolute those data, and that could quite possibly turn into a whole other webinar because it's it's a non-trivial process. But uh, yes, you, good catch. Uh, if you add a protein as a stabilizing factor, it will become uh, it will become a uh, a measurable quantity in in the the uncle assays. Yes.
All right, great. And with that, we come to the end of our webinar. So I want to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on our site at www.genengineers.com for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can forward it to your friends and colleagues, which we highly recommend. I'd like to thank John and Kevin again for their informative presentations, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and very thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Unchained Labs for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen Webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now.